In this Art in the Contemporary World podcast, we're going to be discussing the Visual Arts uh, Worker Forum, uh, which happened on the 9th of May 2014 at Project Arts Centre. And the people that will be discussing this are myself, Declan Long, uh, Tessa Giblin, Curator of Visual Arts at Project Arts Centre, Vi Claffey, um, Independent Curator, and my colleague on the MA Art in the Contemporary World, Francis Halsall. Um, first of all, I'd like to go to Tessa Giblin to talk a little bit about the Visual Arts Workers Forum itself. Um, Tessa, would you be able to give us a little bit of background about this project, um, this collective, uh, and then maybe tell us something about the particular forum which happened uh, on the 9th of May? Sure, Declan. So it began in 2011. We'd been together in a conference in Carlo talking about the situation, state of the arts, situation in the arts and institutions in, in particular in relation to them. And it uh, occurred to us during this conference and, and the train on the way back that there was no kind of united forum that was open, that was democratic, in which the visual arts could speak to each other across their particular roles, across you know the work of artists, the work of institutions, the work of critics, the work of funders, shippers, everybody who has a stake and is involved and wants to find a new way of, of creating dialogue with the intention of either finding new ideas, ways of achieving new goals, or airing problems to each other. So we just began it. We began the forum in, Pro in Project Art Centre in 2011. We called it Work It. And it took the form of the sort of TED conference, the really high energy 10 minute presentations that were <laughs> curated or thought about around uh, set ideas throughout the day. And it was just extraordinary how many people came into it, gave their own time freely and with a really a lot of energy. And probably in that first forum, the um, emphasis was more on profiling new ways of working. So there were, Vari was actually also in that panel talking about Graceland's, her project. I just remember a lot of people commenting about how they had come across new ways of working that they'd really not seen before, even though we're all in each other's backyard. Then the 2013 forum was held in Cork, a collaboration of the National Sculpture Factory and the Glucksman, and that's the way we want it to work. It's myself and Rachel Gilburn and Sean O'Sullivan who continuously see it through, but whichever partner takes it on in a new city will come to it with the ideas, with the resources, with the reason to host it. And so this in Cork was Mary McCarthy and Fiona Kearney, and they put on a wonderful forum. And then back to project for 2014, which is what we're going to discuss here today. And differently to the other forums, I think we kind of went for an ideas base and it became quite institutional, I think, in a way, which might be something that we shift away from in the next one to look at other forms of how people are participating in the arts. Um, but we put it together around three kind of topic sessions and then a keynote from Annie Fletcher, who is a really interesting voice, I think, to look at Ireland because she's an Irish curator. She grew here. She developed here. She developed her limb as a curator and then most of her career has been abroad. So the first panel was called Leading Through the Arts. Uh, the second was called How Are We Contributing? And the third in the afternoon after Annie's keynote was around governance. Okay, and so um, across each of those things then there were a number of different contributors and different panellists and um, quite distinct areas of debate in some ways but mm -hmm. obviously there were some overlaps. <clears throat> I think Tessa will come back to you in a, in a moment or two to maybe get some of your perspectives on on the day and on maybe the, the things that really stood out for you as key issues but um, I wonder having set that up for us could we maybe ask Fari to tell us a little bit about the panel Mm -hmm. um, that you contributed to, which was around uh, the question of governance. Yeah, so um, that, that question of governance came out of um, a discussion that a certain number of people were invited to at Tampa Bar Gallery that was kind of an advanced discussion that Sean um, O'Sullivan and Rachel Gilborn and Tessa Gablin organised um, at Tampa Bar Gallery. And certain things came out of that. A, a kind of, um, there was a whole discussion around the you know, changes in education but in particular, I was interested in thinking into ideas of governance about how governance is structured here. Um, 
and at, you know, thinking into a kind of crisis that's arisen, arisen in relation to what our profession is because of certain crises that have happened around the governance of those kinds of institutions. Um, and to just, rather than sort of lurching from crisis to crisis, I felt it was important to, to look at articulating what our concerns were and to look at articulating how that might be managed and to draw in expertise in relation to those things but um, to draw it in in the kind of more general way and not specifically to do with any given organisation and just to be prepared for what the changes are going to look like in relation to governance. Obviously, there's a crisis. The next thing is that there's a series of changes. What are they going to look like? How do, how do they serve us? And it was very interesting to me how we might, um, how other kind of aspects of the Visual Art Workers Forum may function. And in the meantime, um, something that was quite important, hap that I felt was quite important, happened around the Visual Art Workers Forum where... There's an issue in the, in the Model Arts Centre in Saigo. They're recruiting a new director. There are no artistic members on the, on the, on the board, never mind on the panel. Um, so a discussion developed, a quite important discussion developed on the Facebook page of Visual Art Workers Forum. And that site, that way of kind of holding and keeping on record some of that discussion with people who aren't directly involved, I thought was a really important step. And then, so when it came to the day... Um, we had we drew in expertise around financial management. Uh, Barbara Dawson talked into um, how the how the Hugh Lane had made a series of changes to their governance in in expectation of changes. So th this is kind of an important moment, I think. But the kind of key moment, and this is a really good thing about having a forum, came from the audience uh, from Carissa Farrell, who asked a very pertinent question in relation to the presence of local authority members on the board of institutions, and as to whether that con that constituted a conflict of interest and. So three of the members on the panel said that they felt that it was. Um, and just having that conversation start and that kind of solid response to that, I think, was something around which a lot of people could think um, subsequently. And also we read a case study of what's happening in the model from Nick Miller, who's a person who's very invested over a very long time um, in the Model Arts Centre and the future uh, thereof. So that a lot more people know the background to that story. And I feel a lot, a lot more people will be, pay, will be attentive to what's happening there from now on. So I think those things are, you know, the idea of a forum, um, this idea of kind of positing things, but also a way to have people who are not directly involved make responses and think into something is kind of vital. Tessa, you mentioned before um, we started talking that there was a particular point arising out of that panel um, that one of the... Um, one of the panel members had made about questions of governance and whether there, whether these sorts of issues are things which we get tied up here in Ireland in a very particular way within the visual arts. Do you want to? Well, in fact, yeah, that? it was actually the same point, but maybe just to exemplify it, the the three people who were making this statement were coming from very different positions. Mm -hmm. One was Ivan Cullinan, who I really enjoyed her presentation. She really spoke very passionately about the role of boards and the role of the governors and her primary role whilst being involved in many different uh, aspects of, of structure on those board situations being to primarily put in place an excellent director and I just thought it was an, a wonderfully clear mm -hmm. um, analysis across a number of different uh, situations and she probably gave the most examples about Appointing Sarah Glenny in the IFI. Mm -hmm. Appointing Sarah? Yes. Appointing Sarah. Yes, in the IFI. But the other two who made this point that Vari's referencing were Donald Curtin and Martin O'Sullivan, who had both given more kind of structural or financial uh, presentations about what is the role of, the, of people on boards and what their um, responsibilities and liabilities are, what they should know about. You know, they were also mm -hmm. thinking yeah. to protect people who get into that situation. Yeah. And having done a little bit of research or talking to some peers within the Arts Council before the forum, realising that perhaps it's the financial department of the council um, who, who would be the most likely to become involved with a client organisation that was having governance problems. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones looking at the finances and, and, and the legalities. And the legalities. Mm -hmm. So this is why also Martin O'Sullivan's uh, comments in relation to what Vary was saying about it being, it's kind of been, been accepted that, yes, there was a conflict of interest having local authority funders, funders yeah. being also representative on the board. And it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a natural situation. It's probably grown out of a different funding model as well and, and perhaps a legacy that we 
now uh, now might be the time okay. to start to work. Look at not necessarily through. having to live with them in the way that we always have been. Um, and were there uh, conflicts in this panel, um, differences of approaches, or were there kinds of uh, points being made, things which were broadly reassuring and... You know, uh, there was a sense of consensus about about an idea of there wasn't the value a huge, of boards. There wasn't a huge se- sense of dissent from within the panel talking mm. out into the audience, but there was a huge sense that there had been uh, lots of situations where there had been conflict um, between directors, between organisation directors and boards. So, but, you know, the, what, what this panel was doing was really kind of thinking into the future and ha- and looking, you know, there was a certain amount of reassurance in terms of the fact that lots and lots of organisations, it was Donald Curtin's point, lots of organisations, not just within the arts, are in this situation of having to really examine how governance happens. Um, and there, there, there will be more issues around transparency, particularly, um, and his point, and I've heard this point m- mentioned a lot lately, is in relation to organisations, uh, arts organisations that have a charity number and what that means to be a charity and what that means in terms of all kinds of internal conflicts and the way that organisations, lots of times organisations grow up in Ireland in this particular kind of process of a, a, a kind of accretion and their, their kinds of memberships are, you know, uh, structures that develop without anybody pulling back and looking at what that structure has now developed into. And that, that's a kind of a key thing to say. It's not impossible to correct any of those things. But it's definitely, it's obviously a quite a tender subject because that's with the forum, that is something we try to do. We do try to create dissent. Mm-hmm. Like we try to give a, um, differencing, a, we try to present different opinions within these panels. And yeah. It didn't, it didn't really uh, manifest there, and I wonder whether that could relate to something Sarah Glennie said from the audience, really, at, at the beginning of the day, mm-hmm. in which there is always a fear of retribution through speaking out, and speaking out in, in public. In specifics, I think that's really the important yeah, thing. Yeah, which, which makes it very conflicted for leaders of institutions to also take an externally leading role within culture. This would be another kind of general agenda of the Visual Arts Workers Forum is to try and give a voice to people who will work for the betterment of the sector and culture in general and not just their own tiny little fiefdom or their little thing that that it is that they're entrusted to develop and nurture and and look after. But people who are also wanting to develop the sector at large. And, you know, Sarah Glennie would be exemplary in in this way. And I think she really put her finger on the button when she was when she made this comment from the audience and perhaps that mm. could have been one of the things that we uh, felt in that panel at the yeah. end that there were it was it was a safe there was a safe way of addressing the concerns which is why it was super important to have that address from Nick Miller yes when Nick Miller uh, read we always oh, already talked about it but he read out this uh, yeah very long and um, quite elaborate history of what had happened at the Modern Arts Centre these are questions um, that, as you said, Tessa, are in some ways institutional. Um, the whole day wasn't focused around these sorts of um, discussions. Um, Francis, the panel that you were contributing to, um, which was called How Are We Contributing, uh, had a different kind of uh, focus or style, perhaps. It, it did. Um, and I think there were two main themes from the day. We've talked about one already, which is around governance. And then I think the second theme that emerged was around citizenship. And that was something that emerged out of the panel that I was on. Um, And in part, I was speaking from, although not for, the art school. And uh, The broadly for, I should say. (laughs) (laughs) Not not against. I'm pro, yes. But I wasn't, um, I didn't represent NCAD. Yes. As I sort of made the point at the beginning. I was just a voice within NCAD. But I'm... That's why I was asked to contribute, I guess, as a voice from education. Mm-hmm. And um, a couple of themes arose from that then. One was about what value would our education produce? Um, are we producing workers, for example, or are there other forms of value um, by which the work of the art school may be judged, that not only economic value, for example? Um, and then a point um, came up as to whether the, um, the art school was capable of producing, through an art education, creative citizens who weren't necessarily workers and weren't necessarily going to become artists. And many people in, in the room had trained through art education but were not practising artists, and that, I think that was a positive thing. Um, so the, a, a, a relationship was being considered and was talked through about creativity and citizenship. 
And then a, a thing that emerged out of that then was that art, and I think this is a good thing, has not yet been fully instrumentalized. And the art school might have some sort of potential as an institution, as, as a sort of a phrase I've often used, a zone of relative autonomy, where things can happen, experiments can be kind of um, tested out, ideas can be kind of thought through and so, so forth. So that, I think that was the second theme that sort of emerged from the day, in this panel and in other panels as well. Um, sort of um, notions of citizenship um, that visual artists visual art workers may also be kind of engaged in. And so you were presenting on that panel um, alongside um, three or two or two or three others. Um, how, would you be able to press for us a tiny bit the kind of things they were they were talking about, um, even in the most general terms? Well, um, Gary Phelan um, spoke from the perspective of being an artist, actually, and talked about the responsibility of an artist and how, to a certain extent, he didn't want to have a responsibility, which I think is a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and was also talking about the way in which practices may be um, sort of instrumentalised or not, mm -hmm. um, particularly in relation to the market. And then the idea of the market came up through the presentations of Una Carmody and Claire McAndrew, both of whom talked about um, the audience for art mm -hmm. and as to whether there was a relationship between arts audiences and then art market. And so there was quite a lot of discussion around kind of market. So we came back to that idea of value again, as to whether the only value of the arts was economic or whether there was other forms of value, social, cultural value as well, that could also be produced. And again, like um, the, the question asked before um, with regard to the previous panel, were there points of disagreement here um, or things that people got particularly focused on that were thorny? There actually wasn't. I mean, maybe the other people want to step in yeah, at it was, that point. It was, it was more the impression that I think it made on the audience was really diverse in that um. panel, really excitingly diverse. And the whole point with that panel was to try and create a vision of the arts in Ireland that also people could take away and you could go back to your job or your moment in which you were speaking with the National Campaign for the Arts or with a journalist, and have a broader idea of the various impacts that aren't just your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that people, say, in uh, smaller communities or different uh, areas, could look to those four different aspects of the contribution, the artistic, the active citizen, the financial, and audience. And and think of that as a holistic argument to make to people who, you know, are wanting to cut arts funding by the knees. Let's just be honest about it. And the more that we can, uh, I think anyway, the more that we can tool our weaponry and, and build up the breadth of things that we can use to debate against, just to debate about it, the, the better. And I thought that panel was really excellent. Mm -hmm. And displaying that breath, I found Gary Phelan to just be really stimulating and really exciting. Your presentation as well, Francis and Una and Claire, just so uh, diverse from, from their positions. I think a wonderful thing, if someone with some you know revenue came out of this <laughs> forum, they would commission Claire McAndrew to make a proper study of the, of the depth of the financial impact of the arts, because the thing she was trying to show in her presentations is that it's not just that point of sale. I mean, a lot of her, a lot of her statistics and discussion was coming from primary or secondary market sales, which we all know is not a very big deal here in Ireland. But looking at the wider repercussive circles coming from those sales, so the VAT and the employment status of just hundreds of thousands of individuals who are employed in the secondary businesses of the arts. It's often said at the same time, though, that by going down that road, we sort of sacrifice something in the first place. This, this was, Did, was that a feature that, of the discussion? That was a yeah. point that I raised. And there was an enormous amount of goodwill in the room. And I, I say that because I think that's really significant. Right? Mm -hmm. I think that people were kind of pulling together and thinking together. But I think the next step is to start in the best possible way disagreeing with one another mm -hmm. and yeah. start to kind of bring the debate forward. That is a point of debate. Mm -hmm. And there were yeah. the two p positions were represented on the panel that I was on. Claire talking, as Tessa was saying, about the kind of the economic value that's being produced here. I would have a different perspective, which I raised, and then it came up in the discussion at the end. That as soon as you sort of reduce or level or flatten things to merely economic value, you've already lost the argument yeah. because it's already being conducted in certain terms, the economic terms. And I think there are certain forms of creative practice 
that won't make money and shouldn't make money, and that doesn't mean that they failed, mm -hmm. right? That actually, if we have an expanded sense of value, that there can be values conceived of in sort of cultural, um, intellectual, social, and so forth terms that are not economic, and that you'll never win the economic argument. Absolutely, for them. and that those are the things that need to be written. In. Those are the mm -hmm. kinds of thinking that need to be written into looking at governance. Mm -hmm. That it can't only be led. Uh, or that we can't only be led by certain kinds of concerns with certain sets of rules around them, or we'll, it will skew us in completely the wrong direction. And that you know, that, and I think there does need to be dissent. But I, I mean, it, it, it's a very delicate thing because I think the Visual Art Workers Forum one of the one of the absolute strengths of the Visual Art Workers Forum is that it keeps everybody in the room. Mm -hmm. And so it's how you keep everybody in the room and you manage this dissent into something mm -hmm. that means that we can go forward and keep thinking and keep talking together is is quite an important thing. I think you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, you know, sort of what happens next, and I think there'll be moments when there'll be moments when when there isn't dissent, when everybody is trying to kind of um, to to sort of anxiously think together and move things forward. And, and some of the problems with being so uh, with having been cut at the knees is that is that uh, there's such a weight on your head that that dissent within the ranks becomes something that you we don't there isn't a luxury to do that. There is no time to do that, but it's actually really important to to. Uh, to, to take the, to take those sides yeah, it's to about make those fostering arguments fostering respectful yeah. debate yeah respectful and he, yeah. He, and he's quite a good example because we you brought this up with me before the mm -hmm. panel mm -hmm. even began and I, I do fundamentally disagree I think that we should have those weapons there to be able to debate with it's not that I don't think it's a reduction to one or the other I don't think that we need to be so singular it's a pluralistic uh, uh, conversation and I also feel like in art and culture we can't always be expecting people to debate on our territory, on the things that we know about and the things that we believe and we need to be able to speak into other people's concerns and sometimes those concerns are just going to be primarily financial. Mm -hmm. And to be able to tool ourselves even just a little bit, to be able to be more familiar with those sets of arguments, just, just a bigger portfolio of knowledge. And whoever wants to give up knowledge. I, I completely agree and we can't be naive about no. this. We live in a real world and we can't just expect to be supported just because we do what we do. We now have to make these sort of arguments in concrete mm -hmm. terms. I, it does sort of bite particularly where we work in the art school because there is enormous pressure on us to be producing people who are workers. And I suppose that's why I raised it there, and that's why that's something for us to talk about. And that's why you were on the panel. And that's mm -hmm. why it's so important. And it just—I think it's a case of keeping it balanced. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And keeping and the debate balanced. I, I think we need to sort of keep hold of this idea that because it's an art degree, we haven't failed if at the end of graduation the student doesn't become an artist. Mm. Right? Um, Absolutely. Or a designer. In the same way that if they've studied English literature for three or four years, they don't become a novelist. That doesn't mean that English literature degree has failed as well. Mm. Those, you mentioned, Francis, that there were two things that you saw um, really defining the day for you. Um, Tessa, were there other things that you thought stood out, or Barry, other things that There's stood out? In that, as, uh, yeah, in that first leadership uh, panel, there was also some great presentations in the leadership panel. And uh, everyone, I mean, every, every, everyone presented really well, of course. And in that first panel, Donna Maguire was talking about the artistic leadership of the National Gallery and more a kind of a historical idea that we're not just the kind of art world that we are today. It came from somewhere. And actually, when he was speaking, it sounded a lot like an artist run space when it began, <laughs> which I think is a, quite a, a good thing to keep in mind. But uh, through the presentations of Anna O'Sullivan, Mike Fitzpatrick and Rosha Gowan, there was a, quite an exciting call to action I think, in relation to leadership and the role that people could or should be taking in coming to the table. I think it's no secret that the National Campaign for the Arts has had a very hard time mobilising the visual arts sector to contribute to that campaign. And Val Connor has been wonderful, and a number of other visual arts people prior to her have been wonderful in filling that gap. But there was a moment in which Mike Fitzpatrick answered a question that, that I had said to him, asking, you know, are we coming to the table at the right time? And he's like, you don't wait to be invited to the table. You get there yourself. And he gave this example of when everything started to go into a bit of meltdown in Nimerick, that he was the one on the phone calling department heads, calling people, various bodies engaged and, and, and asking them what was going on and challenging them and provocating. And I think they then turned around and said, well, okay, do mm -hmm. you want the job then? <laughs> and it's quite a, a good example. And Rosha Gowan was also really a, 
really exciting and thinking about what management what other forms the kinds of artistic of leadership. Yeah. management there are? How can we think beyond the models that we that we already know? So, I mean, I found that one really quite exciting. One thing um, that occurs to me is that we haven't mentioned that there was a keynote during the day by yeah, Annie, Annie Fletcher. Well, um, <laughs> there we go. Um, maybe you could tell us something about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I think some, some, you know, a lot of times as well what people talk about at the end of the day like that is what didn't get talked about enough in their view. And, um, <clears throat> and I think that there... There, is a, there was a conversation around risk that, you know, we, we, we were talking now about how we kept the conversation safe. And, I, uh, you know, I feel that I know that Annie had wanted to to talk a little bit more about risk than she felt she did in the day. This is her regret at the end of the day. So, I mean, I think those, those regrets at the end of the day, what we didn't talk enough about, mm-hmm. are really quite telling. Um, and uh, this is what I'm interested in, too, is this the notion of of how we take risk, but but not in the, not in a raw way and not in, a, in this, you know, just... In shouting into a fan or, or whatever it might be that we that we look at risk as something that is part of part of our job and how that how we manage that how we lead, how we lead and how we tool up how we get other kinds of expertise in relation to that rather than just producing that we're also um we're, we're just we're walking into new territory where um and we're, we're bringing everybody else along with us and how that gets managed and how that gets talked about and the other thing is is also this idea that the has mentioned earlier that what we were talking about was very institutionalised. I think there's um, a bit, a big, or around institutions, and I think that there's a big move towards kind of looking at the visual artworks form as a way to also uh, contain or or draw in a lot of, there are lots and lots and lots of very uh, new organisations, and, and this is something that we um, that we looked at with the What Do You Stand For uh, conversation, that at that stage there were, I mean, I we had 15 new organisations that had started up in... That was it, that, and that was a gathering of small organisations uh, yeah. which happened here at NCAD over yeah. two years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. And so that was two, that, yeah, yeah. Well, we organised, and it was, two, it was 2009, and there were 15 or 20 new organisations at that point, so it's interesting to look at maybe where are all of those mm. people now, and it was something that Claire Doyle brought up, that, the, that it's those kinds of organisations that, that, that the Arts Council is seeking to to help to fund at this moment. So, I mean, that's where a new landscape is going to come from. Um, so, the, you know, the discussion around what the concerns for those people are, I think, is something could be a very valuable next conversation for visual art workers. Um, Francis, um, did you have thoughts about the, the Annie Fletcher lecture? Um, I did. I thought it, I mean, it was great. And she's, she's brilliant. And she represented the, the Van Abba Museum. She was talking, she did a... a um, a history of their program, um, and then also talked about sort of models of curating and the relationship between curatorial models, institutional models, and sort of forms of citizenship and so forth. There were two points that I would have liked to have had a conversation about because I, I think they needed to be tested out, and there was a lot of sort of again a sort of agreement in the room, and I wondered whether mm-hmm. that could be. And this is going to sound somewhat paradoxical given about what I'm about to say. Firstly, the notion of radical got mentioned a lot. Mm-hmm radical models of curating, radical models of citizenship and so on. And I think there needs to be a further conversation about what is so good about radicality mm-hmm. for its own sake. Is this a style of radicality? Is this aesthetics of radicality? Or is this or, or structural radicality? Like, what does radical mean? Because there's a version of the radical which is just about the new, which just kind of feeds into the logic of neoliberal capitalism. Mm-hmm. Whereas it seems that there is an opportunity with caveats of sort of using forms of culture of challenging, resisting that. Okay, so radical, sure, but what does radical mean? That wasn't taken on. And then secondly, um, Annie was talking very, very persuasively and very intelligently about agonism as a model. And I wondered whether that is also something to be interrogated. What's so good about agonism? Forms of conversation, forms of discourse based on disagreement. And I said, I know there's a kind of an irony in this, me saying that sort of uh, disagreement. <laughs> but I think there is a difference between dissent and sort of um, consensual kind of disagreement. And I, I wondered whether, and this is open, I'm not making a particular point on this, whether at this particular moment we don't need models of agonism, which can be kind of excluding, maybe we need to work towards some form of uneasy mm-hmm. consensus. Mm-hmm. But I say that in the spirit of kind of conversation. So radicalism, agonism, sort of key words that came out, they need to be interrogated as far as I can. But these seem to be precisely the kinds of questions about uh, for institutions and for visual arts workers of one kind or another, 
that are that are crucial right now. Um, how might you contribute to a conversation? How might you understand yourselves collectively? Um, how might you um, undertake forms of sort of campaigning in ways where you can allow for um, uneasy disagreement, but necessarily momentum in the in the discussion? So all of this seems hugely hugely pertinent. And um, Tessa, do you want to maybe offer us a final word that maybe suggests a, a where now possibility for um, for the Visual Arts Workers Forum? Well, I mean, uh, we're looking for pitches. We're looking for people to come forward and say that they'd like to host the next one. And we have a, a number of people who are interested in doing it. It's no small undertaking. You can see yourself in the day, like the way that Vari was involved in this one was just a, a big act of goodwill and, you know, motivation. But people really need to take on the whole um, programming of the day as well as the financial responsibility. Um, that's one thing I would like to underline, though, and I think it makes it possible for, say, Claire Doyle to speak from the audience on these topics, is that this is not a funded organisation. It's completely voluntary. And, in fact, the day was... Um, the, the costs of the day were primarily covered by the ticket sales, which I was just so delighted with because it's another way of the sector kind of paying for itself or taking responsibility for itself. It was perhaps quite curatorially focused in, in passages, but in relation to, say, the, say any saying at the end that, that, the, that risk had not been discussed enough, I really felt like it was absolutely there on the table from the moment that she started speaking about these examples of exhibitions. And these are the ones, I am a curator, but I find them so exciting, these projects in which they go back into that collection of the Van Arba Museum, one of the most significant collections post-war Europe has, and actively destabilize it by asking people to perhaps question these broad narratives within history. And I think it related very much to Una Kamadi's presentation on arts audiences and to Claire McAndrew's presentation around, and around international finances, asking people to come in and question the provenance of an artwork that has you know, come to the collection post-World War II. It's a very risky thing for a massive museum with massive financial liabilities to do. And rather than always speaking through theory or, or more kind of strategic ways, to speak through art into those questions, through artistic means, which that form of curating is to me, I, I just find so exciting. And I think that that sort of attitude might have influenced quite a lot of people on the day. So where it goes from here, whoever takes it on will come with their own set of interests and their own set of questions. Let's say a studio program wants to host the next one. They might have a different set of priorities within, but Rachel Gilburn and Sean O'Sullivan and myself will continue to push it forward and support it. And, um, and Can I ask it, um, a technical question yeah. or a practical question? It's very much within the Republic of Ireland, is it, or is it something that could go north or could go on tour to... Scotland or England. I mean, is it something that you would you would be interested in seeing moving beyond this immediate? Um, I could do anything, region. Declan, and that's that's the thing. It's not it's not like no one owns it. It's not ours. We we set it up and we'll continue to support it. But if the sector want it to go to the north, it'll go to the north. If they want it to go on tour, take it on tour. You know, it's it's supposed to be a really unrooted organization that can respond and shift and mold itself to whatever it is the sector wants to talk about and however the sector defines itself whoever really cares but again I think it, it is it is kind of um, hedged by a group of people who care about the growth of the sector and culture beyond their own personal Take activities. activities yeah. well, that sounds like a good point to conclude <laughs> on um, full of optimism um, so um, Tessa Gilbert and Vary Claffey, Francis Halso, thank you very much.